Uh, so, hi everyone. My name is Greg Price. Uh, I'll be talking about mem policy extensions to better support heterogeneous memory systems. Uh, sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Uh, if you have any questions either after the talk, feel free to reach out to me on the mailing list or just reach out to me directly. It's, uh, it's also fine. Um, so let's, here we go. So let's talk about what we're going to talk about. Um, I'm going to dive into a little bit about what we mean by heterogeneity because it's a little complicated. And I'm sure some of you are, you know, asking the question, why are we still talking about mem policy? Everyone's talking about tiering. They're somewhat orthogonal, and I'll discuss why that's important. Uh, we'll talk about the new, uh, uh, there's a new mem policy that we just released and got upstream in, in version 6.9. Uh, way to dinner leave. Uh, I learned a bunch of lessons from that and got a bunch of good feedback from a lot of interested parties. And that's going to lead to some uh, additional future work. Uh, there's some new policy ideas that have been thrown around, uh, including some new syscalls and some new uh, migrate on mbind stuff as well. And then probably I saved the more contentious piece for last, which is uh, there's been a bunch of interested parties who have been suggesting, well, what if we just have mem policy in C group? And there's a bunch of reasons why that's maybe good, bad, and ugly, uh, and we'll kind of dive into it a little bit. Uh, feel free, if there's any questions along the way, to just interrupt. Uh, it'll be easier for me to, to field questions in that regard, because this is really going to be a smattering of ideas in this talk. Uh, so heterogeneity. Uh, this is not a talk about PMEM or CXL or GPUs or whatever. It, it's more general than that, right? So if you use a two-socket server, I contend that you are using a heterogeneous memory system. And you really have to think about this in terms of where you have a task executing on your system. If you have a task ex executing on socket zero and you have DRAM attached to socket zero and socket one, well, if you're accessing memory uh, across these sockets, you are actually accessing heterogeneous memory because the DRAM on the remote socket has different latency and bandwidth uh, uh, than, the, than the local socket. Uh, so that's really what we mean by heterogeneity. In more, in a more you know future-looking uh, perspective, you can expect to see systems that are you know light or not, somewhat of a monstrosity like this, where you might have HBM, DRAM, local C CXL memory, uh, CXL memory that's behind a switch. You might have HBM on a GPU that's directly mapped and managed, and it's going to get complicated rather fast. And so the current mem policy subsystem is not well built to reason about a system like this. And I would contend that it's also not well built to reason about a system like this either. And so that's what we've started to look at uh, in building new policies. So second question, why am I focused on mem policy? Shouldn't I be focused on tiering like everyone else is kind of looking at? And I, I kind of uh, separate these two uh, logically into allocation policy versus movement policy. So mem policy is a per task or per VMA NUMA policy that controls node selection at allocation time. So when I say mem policy, you should think allocation policy or node selection policy at the time a, a, a page is faulted in. Tiering is more migration focused, generally speaking. It does go into the allocation side a little bit, but generally speaking, when you hear tiering, you should be thinking movement policy. Where am I moving data to? Is it this tier, that tier, et cetera? In a perfect world, we would always kind of pick the right placement on allocation and then never move that memory again. But in reality, that's not really uh, feasible. The allocation policy will pretty much always be wrong for some definition of wrong in space time, right? Memory tends to get hot and then cold and then hot and then cold and fill up and maybe we want to demote stuff. And so tiering is useful. I would also say that an effective allocation policy is just as useful, but the two will need to be uh, uh, well, the, the two will need to be used effectively to, to manage heterogeneous systems. Uh, so where are we at right now with mem policy? As I mentioned, mem policy is uh, task local, which means every single thread can have a separate mem policy for itself that covers all of its VMAs. It can also be VMA local, which means an individual VMA, including shared VMAs or memory regions, can also have an explicit a mem policy. And I have some things uh, highlighted in red here, like interleave accounting and ref counts that uh, are alluding to the fact that there's some warts in the system that probably need to be handled into the future if we're going to be more effective with this. Uh, but a mem policy is basically a mode and a, and a node mask. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about those modes in a second. 
And you'll note that there are some interactions with CPU sets or C groups as well. And there's a ref count and, and we'll get into that. Uh, but really it's not all that complicated. The, the system is relatively uh, small, uh, but there are a lot of interconnected components that we have to worry about. A quick mem policy crash course and we'll get right into it. There's basically four different types of policies. The default or local policy basically says on allocation, if local memory is available, use that. The preferred one uh, basically says if, if memory is available on the preferred node, use that. Interleave is a round robin distribution of memory. Basically, every node gets one page in round robin mode. And then weighted interleave is basically round robin, uh, but with uh, different uh, weights applied. So you can have different distributions of memory based on the different node, kind of using nodes as a, uh, as a tier stand-in, more or less. So let's take a, talk about the new mem policy that just launched in 6.9, and then we'll talk about some of the lessons learned from that. So weighted interleave is basically interleave, but it's weighted. It just went upstream in 6.9, and there's one set of global quote-unquote weights that were added to SysFS that you can modify. And the, uh, the observation was basically, oh, the local DRAM channel, for example, might have 128 gigabytes a second of bandwidth. But in order to go to a remote socket, it has to go across a, a cross socket interconnect. And that cross socket interconnect could be lower in bandwidth than the remote DRAM, which really means your effective DRAM or your effective bandwidth is whatever that cross socket interconnect is. And that means in this setup, for example, this very simple setup, uh, the optimal bandwidth would be a two to one distribution of weights ac uh, across these, these two nodes. Um, Latency is a little more complicated. Uh, you know, we have to ask the question, is bandwidth actively saturated? Is the capacity saturated? Uh, and and that can cause you to say, well, if if the bandwidth is saturated, it might be better for latency to put hot pages on a remote node to allow more concurrent uh, memory requests, for example. So until weighted interleave showed up, it wasn't really possible to do this, at least not easily. Now weighted interleave allows us to do this for relatively simple forms of tasks uh, and, and to be able to capture this type of topological nuance uh, directly in the, in the mem policy system. So if you want to check that out, it's all upstream. It's all the, the man pages are present. It's been documented. Uh, so we learned some lessons while implementing this, however. Uh, mem policy hasn't really been uh, brought forward as the, the computing environment has evolved. Um, so this is just one test I'm going to show you. Uh, it was a single socket system with a CXL memory expander. You can think of it as two tiers. The bandwidth ratio for this system was nine to one, right? Uh, I used a stream benchmark, which very simply just uses a bunch of heap memory and drives bandwidth to those regions. If we use the default interleave, the round robin one to one interleave, you can see that it was 78% slower than DRAM. Right. And this is one of the reasons why if you go out and you talk to a ton of people about, oh, are you using NUMA control? Are you, are you using NUMA policies, et cetera? They'll say, no, NUMA sucks. And, and this is one of those reasons is it intuitively, it doesn't seem like a good idea to just use interleave because you're not going to have some of those topological complexities captured. Weighted interleave, when you use it from the task perspective, not the VMA perspective, but the task-wide weighted interleave, you get better results. And that can be plus or minus 5%, give or take. Um, this still kind of sucks, right? Uh, I'd really like to get that 4% consistently if possible, but it is significantly better. And it lets you to use more of the resources that you have available. And this is one the biggest takeaway. If I use mBind instead and apply it only to the VMA regions that are going to drive bandwidth, I get a consistent 25 to 4% increase in performance. Now, obviously, this is going to be workload dependent, but this is a stand-in for kind of a general workload. And, and really, these last two points should tell you the, the problem with the existing mem policy system, right? There is a gap between can we do something better than just applying a mem policy to every single VMA or requiring uh, a task to be NUMA aware, right? So in order to use mBind, a task has to be NUMA aware. Can we make the targeted stuff a little more available and in a natural way? And, and we'll jump into that. 
Um, so this is where we this this is some major lessons learned from from implementing weighted interleave. Um, there is some future work that is uh, still pending for the weighted interleave. Uh, a is uh, default to global sysfs weights. Right now, the default operates pretty much the same as standard interleave. An administrator or some kind of daemon is expected to go in and toggle those weights to the uh, to the to the defaults that you expect to apply to various tiers. Uh, we do have an RFC out based on various HMAT info, for example, provided by the CXL driver or other other forms. Uh, but this isn't trivial. Uh, in particular, large NUMA systems, systems that might have a thousand nodes or two thousand nodes or three thousand nodes, what have you. Uh, De calculating default weights is actually relatively complex because you're doing some complex divisions. And if you happen to hit a prime number, the whole thing falls apart. Um, so if you have a use case for something like this and you have a large NUMA system, please reach out to me. I, I would love to see an example setup of that and how we might mitigate that issue. Um, but there is an RFC out and I expect that to move along uh, pretty pretty quickly. The other one is task local weights. This was dropped from the initial uh, feature support, and that was because it required uh, additional syscalls or maybe procfs extensions. Um, but it was relayed to me that uh, that would probably hold up the feature as a whole, and uh, it really needs users to justify such an extension. Uh, so if you have a need for something like task local weights, where each individual task has different usages of different uh, tiers, uh, please reach out, please hit the RFC, and uh, we can discuss. So let's get back to talking about mem policy in general in a heterogeneous world. Uh, there's a few warts on the system and some observations uh, that have held over the assessment. Um, biggest one is that large NUMA systems have become very unwieldy in trying to apply these like task local or global mem policies, especially when it comes to sub NUMA clustering, it's really, really hard to use these things for real world benefit. It's hard to reason about these systems. And, uh, and this is just a general statement for, you know, CXL folk or anyone that is uh, working on a system or portions of the system that generate new nodes. Uh, you should probably consider consolidating wherever is possible or feasible. Uh, an example of that would be CXL interleave sets. If you have a bunch of local CXL memory expanders, it would be a lot easier to reason about those if there's fewer nodes involved. So using interleave sets is preferential uh, to end users uh, to be able to apply better policies. Um, but there, there's a whole conversation that has to be had around that that side. Um, in terms of maintaining the subsystem, the biggest wart on the mem policy subsystem is the fact that it is written in a very current task centric way. And by that, I mean only the current task can change its own mem policy. As you can see, the syscall that I included in here doesn't tell you, you know, doesn't provide a PID FD, doesn't provide you a way to toggle another task's uh, mem policy. And this is problematic for a variety of reasons. Um, and uh, by extension, the same thing, VMA policies can only be changed by tasks with access to that VMA, so shared memory regions, right? Um, changing this, the fact that only the current task can toggle its uh, uh, system is actually really rather annoying because it utilizes the current, I guess, mnemonic that says, hey, check the current task permissions to do this particular operation. And ripping that reference to current out and changing it to a task-driven thing is it requires replumbing through at least two or three other subsystems, right? Shared memory subsystem, VMA subsystem, and a couple others. Um, and that current task centric uh, design is actually performance related. Uh, mem policy as it stands today is actually completely lockless in the allocation path for a very good reason. Uh, locks are expensive, right? Um, but there's also reference counting that is present to track those shared memory policies. And um, now today we're using RCU uh, depending on the different policies applied. So there's a really complex locking mechanism depending on which direction you are ac accessing mem policy from. It can come in from C groups, it can come in from the local task, uh, and it can come in through shared memory regions. And so this probably will end up requiring some level of a refactor to drive everything towards a more RCU driven 
uh, uh, update and, and uh, uh, update policy. So that that's a major word on the system and something we're still still struggling with, uh, even though that the component itself is really not that big. And the last one is, and I alluded to this, there's C group interactions, right? Uh, from this perspective, mem policy cannot be used to violate C group restrictions. Mems allowed is is one of these. You can call this CPU sets, if you will. Um, but I shouldn't be able to tell mem policy, hey, allocate from node four if CPU sets limits me to accessing only nodes zero through three, as an example. And so there are some complex interactions that go on with, well, what if C groups changes its MEMS allowed at runtime? And that's something that uh, there's a complex locking structure in C groups, so we can't just probe C groups easily uh, either on changes. So C group driven migrations, for example, may cause weird rebindings. And we'll talk about how that looks and it is uh, somewhat rather nasty. <laughs> Can I have a question, Gregory? Of course. Yeah. Uh, so here's Michael. Uh, you're, yeah, uh, what you're saying is, is correct, but uh, my question is mostly uh, how do you envision that external party could manipulate per VMA memory policies with, without a cooperation with that application? Because that just sounds to me like uh, solving a problem by creating tons of other problems. Be uh, of course. Uh, yeah, uh, of course. And I, I actually agree with you. And there's an RFC out there right now about how to, uh, you know, having process and bind uh, work. And you're not wrong. Like it is, it is very complicated and it can potentially be uh, a very security uh, uh, sensitive and uh, I think the uh, key observation right now for me is it should be possible without causing problems, if only because shared memory regions can have uh, policies, right? And so it is technically already possible for one task to change another task's VMA policy by nature of a shared memory region having a, a mem policy. And so I, I haven't done all of the digging into the specific mechanics there. But since that's already possible to do, and I don't know whether if that's an intended feature or just something that is, um, but if it is, if it was an intended feature and it is something that is, then probably we can use the same mechanisms to allow for that, right? Obviously this type of interface is gonna use like administrator at a minimum, if not nice and et cetera, uh, because you're changing allocation policies. But uh, hopefully I answered your question enough. <laughs> Well, I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I think the, 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 the core of the answer really is, uh, I'm not sure entirely. Uh, however, it does appear that there is a way to go about doing this that isn't going to be a complete upheaval because the shared memory regions already allow for uh, shared policies. Yeah, no, no question about shared memory. And also, I think that uh, PDF, uh, PIDFD uh, interface to change the global policy for the task is something that is reasonable because uh, that's what C groups do for all the processes that are living yep. in that C group. But I'm not really sure that we want to have that per VMA because that just opens a lot of uh, weird cases where, uh, and, and I clearly do not see a uh, use case for that because uh, you really have to have an intimate understanding of the application to in order to do that and if you do have that kind of understanding then probably something like a user fold fd might be a better way to approach that yep but, uh, but i, I don't want to hijack on... more of that and there is another question no, in, okay. uh... sure go ahead i do have a slide on that specifically so we, we can discuss it at that point so there's another question uh hi this is david so uh i was just wondering how do we envision that in the long term that like some application will go around and change random policies for VMAs? Or would it be an option that an application explicitly opts in into having a, let, let's call it a managed VMA policy, or however you would want to call that, that like, for example, the application allocates some unique ID and sets the VMA policy to that unique ID. And then like you have a clean interface where somebody can just like, modify that across multiple VMAs, I, I don't know, but like have some kind of abstraction and an explicit explicit opt-in from 
the application that like a certain memory area can be can be changed by an external authority. Yep. And and I, I, I think so the key observation one is just allowing it to happen from the per first case is, as Michal was saying is um, that's the question we have to answer first and then how do you design the interfaces is second. And I, I think where we are right now with that RFC is it's not uh, in a state that I think anyone can agree on. And I think all of these are absolutely valid uh, questions. Um, so in the long term, I think it's more likely, as Mikhail said, um, it's more likely not we're going to reach directly in with Mbind to change mappings for a particular VMA. I think it's more reasonable to try and enrich the MEM policy system to use existing information like MADVISE flags, MMAP flags, VMA information to just make decisions about placement without having specific MBIND uh, uh, calls required. Um, and I actually have a, a few slides on that coming up here. Um, so this is the existing observations of words, and then we're going to get into some of the more proposals. So, uh, so, so any, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so this is Liam. Uh, so the the mem policy right now um, is static. If if you have this, uh, you get the weighted uh, interleave. If the scheduler switches where the task is, how does that affect? Uh, the layout of the memory and and what occurs next. Do do we need to change the mem policy based on the CPU it's running on? So, very good observation, and that is something we we spent a lot of time talking about. And uh, the reason why we settled on those global weights in uh, SysFS was because of this migration issue. Right. If you have, for example, task local weights and you have a migration from one socket to another or what have you, uh, yeah, all of your weighting gets really messed up. And in particular, uh, some of these rebinding, some of these rebinding issues already happen. And and you're right, we need a way to kind of clean that up and get a little smarter about it because you can end up with really weird rebindings, or you can end up with your task running on socket one and all of your memory being on socket zero. And there's no good way right now using the mem policy system on a rebind to trigger all of those migrations to occur in some scenarios. Well, so I don't I'm know. actually going to talk about that. I Go don't ahead. know if you really want to migrate, but you want to change your policy to be accurate for, for future running. And it, it almost seems like every policy will have a reflection policy based on each node in the system. So depending on which node you end up running on, your policy is changed to be uh, a flip or I don't know if you, if you think of four or, or multiple uh, CPUs, yep. it gets even messier. Well, so right now with the weighted interleave, because they're global, um, when a migration occurs, it'll start using the, the task local perspective and, 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 and wait appropriately. So for example, if it just moves from socket zero to socket one, it'll see that socket one has a higher weight than a, than a, a remote task. But the, the, yes, you're right. It is right now we don't really have a good topological way to capture cross socket interconnects in particular with this system. Um, and this is where, as you get more and more NUMA nodes and more and more compute nodes in particular, it becomes unwieldy. And that, that's kind of the, the first bullet point on this, is large NUMA systems get to become very unwieldy in that regard. So yeah, uh, we, we need to have that discussion more uh, explicitly. Um, and we have discussed it uh, uh, to some extent. And that's one of the reasons why task local waiting got pushed off to a, a future release, because it was hard to reason about what happens on migrations. Also, in, in the mobile space, we have lower powered cores that are, that are managing the, uh, the freeing of memory. And so if you think about what's going on there uh, in respect to, to what the policies are, then um, basically all of the memory it is accessing is remote and yep. it's slower. Yep. Yep. And then, uh, yeah, I would love to get more input from the mobile uh, mobile side for sure. Um, so I'm going to push along because I got a couple more slides to get through and I'm running short on time here. So a um, couple feature proposals that have been talked about. I already mentioned this earlier. Uh, is it possible for us to get closer to that VMA mem policy result by using task of global mem policies? And the idea here would be can we use existing information like MMAT flags or MADVISE or VMA info or C group data 
to avoid things like interleaving code mappings or stack mappings, for example. And that that's basically what I did using the VMA or mBind policies uh, with the, the stream benchmark is you're basically avoiding interleaving stuff that isn't really driving bandwidth. Um, and so there's some open questions here. It seems like a reasonable lift for a reasonable amount of pain, but there's some research and some plumbing that needs to be assessed here. Um, this is one thing that doesn't really have an RFC yet. Um, process mBind, we already did, we basically just discussed this. There is an RFC for this available. Uh, there's a lot of warts because of the current task-centric design of MEM policy at the moment, um, but it does, to an extent, work in a prototype uh, phase. Um, it could be thought of as a quote unquote crude memory tiering mechanism. I'm not sure how, as, as others alluded to, I'm not sure how much we want to support that as a, you know, tier one feature, but you can think of it that way. Uh, but job schedulers might have some interest in, in this type of feature though, uh, for things like resource use compaction, you know, gathering stuff in or reclaim and, and such. Um, and the core problem is the fact that it's all current task and it can open up a can of worms in that regards, right? So there are security implications. There are performance implications because this code is in the allocation hot path. Uh, so if this is something that is, is in the foreseeable future, this is going to be very careful work uh, to, to make a uh, possibility. Um, migrate and MPine for interleave. This is one, something I wanted to touch on to, to give you an example of how migration is complicated with mem policy. Uh, mbind right now only migrates memory when a node is removed, right? So if I'm currently interleaving over set one, two, and I move to uh, set three, four, then I'll migrate everything on node one to node three and everything on node three to node four. But if I'm currently, for whatever reason, only interleaving on one node and I add a node, no migrations will occur, right? So there's no redistribution of memory. That might actually be nice, even though it is expensive to do. Uh, but so is, you know, the existing uh, migration. So like if if the migration in case one is supported, then maybe the migration in case two uh, might be nice to have as an opt-in, maybe not as a default, for example. Um, so the two proposals that are out there, can we allow redistrib redistribution of interleave regions and allow the application of weights on distribution? Um, you know, you can think of this as another a crude tiering mechanism. Not sure. Again, not sure how much I want to support that as a as a feature, but it is a, an idea. And mostly, this is useful for things like job schedulers, so that they can have reliable and predictable results when they migrate uh, C groups or tasks from one place to another and bind them. Um, and this is really like the the end one that's going to have the most contention. Uh, is there a reason to? have a C group mem policy, right? We've had mem policy, but what about second mem policy? What if we just add a mem policy to a C group and have all of the tasks in that C group either inherit or use it directly, right? So mem policy being task local allows it to be mostly lockless and C groups is not lockless. In effect, it's uh, iteratively lock. Uh, there's, there's iterative locks that you can end up going through. Um, I know uh, one reason on that uh, this has been a problem in the past is that it's really hard to define the reasonable hierarchical behavior of that, and yes. that's an, a hard requirement for any features. So yes. um, and that, that's where you might really hit the, that end. Yeah, and I have one last slide that, that talks about some of the feedback. So the two motivations here, we have an allocation policy management of a set of processes and threads. That would be really nice. Um, and this, it would allow the simplification, simplification of allocation policy when jobs are migrated. So if you're migrated from one C group to another, you just get the new allocation policy. That would be really nice. Um, but this has gotten some skepticism and feedback, you know, from Tejun, I've already gotten, he said, he's not sure that this really belongs in C group at all. A explicit point. It's unclear what the hierarchical relationship means. Um, and that is not something I've fully worked through and I'm not sure I will be able to work through it, but it is worth exploring, I think. Um, a yeah, quote from Nicole, you know, it CPU set seems like a good fit, but there was some contention there. So the too long didn't read of this is there's no real consensus on this particular idea yet. Although there is a in talking to quite a few people, there is quite a few people that are like, man, I wish this existed. It would be so nice from a Kubernetes perspective or for whatever my container system. It would be really nice to be able to just redefine where allocations occur 
without having to reach in and, and change things or make my my software pneumo aware. Um, so I'm going to continue pushing down this path and looking for solutions. And I would love it for you know you to join me. And that's kind of where I'm at. I think I'm at time. Any other last questions before we hop over to the next? Hey, there seems to be no other questions. Thanks a lot and uh, good luck. I mean, uh, this is a hard topic. And uh, even though that it seems that there are many dead ends, I believe that uh, it, it's worth pursuing. So thanks a lot. I think so too. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.